Okay. Cool. So we'll go ahead and get started with the second half. <coughs> All right. Uh, so we just talked about the, the breaking algorithms for what? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I went the wrong way. So we just talked about the breaking algorithm for graphemes. Okay. So remember I told you about like there's grapheme breaks or sentence breaks, line breaks, paragraph breaks. The, uh, the odd one out really is line breaks. And the reason it's the odd one out is that you can't just return a sequence of uh, ranges that delimit like the places where the breaks are because you've got two kinds of breaks, okay? You've got hard line breaks and just sort of optional line breaks. The way you use the optional ones is, let's say you've got a certain line width, right? And you're going through and you're trying to figure out where to break the line. You get all the places where you can break the line and you pick the one that doesn't exceed your line width. Okay, so these are just sort of optional places. And then you come into like a CRLF pair, and then now you have to break the line there because that's what those characters mean. Okay, so you get these two different kinds. Uh, so because of that, it's, um, there's this like previous, uh, there's a hard line break and a possible line break. And the possible line break one <coughs> actually, uh, it has a, um, uh, a range that you get. Uh, let me see if I can remember this correctly. Um, well, Forget I said that part. So the point is there's a hard line break version and then there's the optional line break version. So there's two APIs that sort of mirror the other APIs here for the line break algorithms. Um, and let me see if I've got a slide on this thing I was thinking of. Nope, I don't. Okay, so I'll just tell you. So the place where this is um, really interesting is when you've got that lazy range um, kind of, of way of getting at the breaks. When you get the lazy range, what you get is a pair of iterators. Um, and if you get that pair of iterators as a range, the range doesn't just have the, um, uh, the begin and iterate itself. It's also got a piece of information that tells you whether it's a hard or an optional line break. So as you're going through the sequence, you can actually tell which is which. If you only care about the hard line breaks, then you would use the hard line break specific part of the API. Okay. All right. So there's one iterator that corresponds to all these kind of text segmentation algorithms. Uh, and it's the grapheme iterator. This is implementable as an O1 um, operation for increment and dereference, et cetera. And that's what you need to make an iterator, right? Um, the others are not implementable necessarily with O1 operations. I haven't been able to prove to myself they are anyway. Because the way a lot of these are specified is, um, for instance, the sentence break will say, you know, go until you reach this sort of construct. And when you see this part, you have to go until you see that part. And there's a an open-ended number of steps you have to do. And if you come to the end of this unbounded uh, look ahead, and what you find is that the thing that's after the look ahead is not the, the terminating part of the sequence, right? The sequence is some prefix, some arbitrary number of things in the middle, and then some suffix. And if you don't see the suffix at the end, then you go back to where you started and you try the next alternative, okay? <coughs> so that is, that is an uh, arbitrary bound on one part of the step you do to do the increment. So um, I don't know that I can prove that even if you do that arbitrary look ahead, then the next step you do was, won't have to do the arbitrary look ahead and so you're not in that case anymore. So I just left it that I've only got a grapheme iterator. I don't have a line iterator or a paragraph iterator or anything, just graphemes. Okay. Now I've got this utility type, which we've already seen before, but it's a, a code point range. And this is, again, range friendly, so you can construct it from an iterator and a sentinel uh, if you want to, and it has the you know, type defs for that, so it'll return, or it has the types for those, so respectively, so it'll return begin and end, which may be different types. Typically, you're gonna have those both as the same iterator type, but one of them might be some, I represent the end of a null terminated string or some other kind of terminating condition. And this guy's real simple, right? Just begin and end, and it has an empty, and that's it. You can construct it from a pair, or you can default construct it. It's very, very simple. The nice thing about those is it plays well with range base four. It plays well with range base four. That's exactly why it exists. Yeah. And um, the, the nice thing about this is that it also plays well with the C20 range based four. Or I guess, did that make it into the 17? I forget. 17. But 17? Thank you. Um, which can have different um, uh, iterator and, and terminating uh, and end iterator, begin and end iterators, I should say. Uh, okay. So the grapheme iterator <coughs> looks like this. Uh, the value type is one of these code point ranges, okay? So it is going to iterate across some sequence of code points, and what it's going to give you is these begin-end pairs uh, it within the, uh, the underlying range, okay? And each begin-end pair represents one grapheme. Yes? But, uh, 
You can hate me being pedantic on you, but that's <laughs> not a bidirectional iterator if value type is not a reference type. It's not bidirectional value type is not a reference type? The reference type has to be a true reference for forward iteration beyond. You, you said uh, like, if reference is, is reference has to, yeah, because reference, reference has to be a, factor, yeah. Yes, okay. No, that's that's um, that's true. And uh, so this is it's a I guess that makes it a proxy iterator that you can go both directions with. Um, no, we don't we don't have good language for that yet. We, we yeah. Need it. Yeah. So we that yeah, that's Yeah, that's a good point. So that that might be uh, that might be a hole here. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, some of that stuff is fixed by the range TS, no? But I don't know if this is one of the things. This is, do you guys know? Don't know. No. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, all right. There, there is, that, there is a language <coughs> definition for like adding proxy iterators to in the range TS. So yeah. that's a thing they do cover. Right, and so um, that, that was kind of my memory of it too. The comment was that there's language for handling proxy iterators as first class iterators, and then you can have a category for the, the <coughs> proxy. But I, I don't know all the details. Um, yeah, so certainly if I'm targeting C++11, this may be uh, problematic, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> again, you can default construct one of these iterators, you can create it from a, a range. In this case, you give it the full sequence and then the place you are within the sequence. Um, again, because you might have to go backwards a bit, might have to go forwards a bit, you need to know the balance on both sides. Uh, dereference gives you one of these value types. The pointer gives you a special um, pointer type that um, Oh, no, I'm sorry, it just gives you a point of the value type because uh, this is a different kind of proxy than, than, I, than I was thinking of. But the value type is actually in here somewhere. The interesting part about this, though, the part that's maybe been unexpected is it's got this base, which you're used to seeing from reverse iterators, but in this case, it gives you the, uh, the grapheme member is uh, one of these value types, right? This, the code, code point range itself, and it gives you the beginning of that code point range, okay? And the reason this exists is because with a grapheme iterator, you can iterate over all the graphemes of a, of a sequence, of a UTF-8 encoded, normalized, Unicode-aware sequence of, of code points, right? And when you iterate across those, you might at some point say like, well, you know what? I need to pass this to an algorithm that cares about code points. It doesn't care about graphemes. So the way I get at the underlying code point iterator is by saying base, okay? The begin, I say base, and at the end, I say base, and that gives me the code point iterators to the underlying uh, first and last sequence that corresponds to the whole sequence that the grapheme iterators refer to, okay? Uh, and so here's some examples of how we might use these things. Okay, so if for, for the, um, you know, place we're gonna get our data from, we've got the string. So, you know, you would probably do a lot of this stuff with a text or something, but because I haven't gotten to the text layer yet, the, all these examples are in terms of string, but that's sort of an artifact of the order in which I'm presenting this stuff. Yeah? Can I say base base and get the code units? We'll get there, we'll get there, okay. <laughs> So you start with the string. I've got some stuff in the string. And then I've got this nice helper that I, I showed before, UTF-32 uh, range. And I, I construct that from the string. So this just gives me you know, um, the UTF-32 transcoding iterators for the first and last of the string. And then um, I've got some iterator here, which is a grapheme iterator, uh, which is, that's incorrect. This should have been a UTF-32 transcoding iterator that I wrote there. Uh, and then that is, uh, made from the beginning of this range and the end of this range and the iterator that we care about is the begin. We do the same thing for the end, except that in between the begin and end, the, the iterator we care about is the end, okay? And then it's really simple. I just <coughs> iterate across those in a for loop, use the grapheme however I want. Yes? Um, to simplify this further in 17, I guess, with um, class tempo argument deduction, we wouldn't need to say the text string iterator in the middle? Yes, and so this kind of error wouldn't happen. The, the comment from Alistair was, uh, CTAD will let you uh, elide the angly bracket bit there and it all will work for you nicely. Um, if I would care about code points though, I would say um, uh, the same kind of for loop except I would say dot base for the begin and end. Uh, and then I can uh, iterate over all the code points here. And this is what Mark just asked about, can I say base base? And yes, you can. So if I wanna make a copy of the string and I wanna make it from this, um, <coughs> this uh, pair of grapheme iterators, then it would say base base. So that goes into this code point iterator to get, you know, the dot base goes in the code point iterator. But the code point iterator is a transcoding iterator from UTF-8. If it was just a pointer to some UN32 sequence, then I couldn't do that. But because it happens to be from the transcoding iterator, the transcoding iterators also provide a base. <coughs> so any place where you see grapheme iterators with UTF-8 encoded stuff, the idiom is always, I say base to get to the code point range, or I say base base to get to the underlying UTF-8 char range, okay? And that's used consistently from here out. Mark. 
Is there any overhead, or is that just, does that just <coughs> Yeah, that, that just inlines away. There's no overhead associated with, with these calls in particular. Yeah. OK. So collation. <clears throat> We've talked about text segmentation and normalization. And now it's time to talk about collation. So collation is the comparison of two strings when you want to search or, or compare. OK? And the way collation works is weird. OK? It is an odd way to specify things. So there's these multiple levels that you have to consider. <laughs> there's like a primary level or level one. Uh, and that is the basic difference between two characters, right? So <clears throat> if I've got um, an A and a capital A, they're the same at the primary level. They're the same kind of thing. They're the same like notional character from some language in this particular case from uh, you know, the Latin uh, alphabet. And if I have a lowercase a and a lowercase b, those are actually fundamentally different things, right? They're two different characters from the Latin alphabet. <coughs> So level two has accent differences for languages that have accents. Level three has variants that include differences in case, but there's some other variants too in different languages. And level four contains punctuation, okay? So you have these four different levels of difference when you look at a particular character that you might have to consider. And so the way you compare two strings, you have to build like these sequences uh, of these different, uh, compose of these different levels. And here's what a sequence looks like. <coughs> You have all the L1 weights first, and then optionally you have the L2 through L3, uh, through L4 weights rather, um, and then you have all the L2 weights if you have those, and if you optionally have L3, you have all of those, and then they're followed by the fourth weights if you have any of those, okay? You don't have, uh, you don't have to have any of them but L1, uh, with the exception that, you know, they're not all optional, you can't have gaps in the middle, right? You can't have L4 and L1, you have to have L2 and L3 in there as well. <coughs> so, Yeah, like I said, you, you have to have those. Um, so the length of the sort key depends on which levels you want to consider. So you can say, I just want to do L1 comparisons. And so my sort keys are basically going to look at all the, the, the uh, code points and the, the string that I want to make a sort key for. And it's going to give me all the L1 weights for those. Some of the L1 weights might not exist, and so it might be a little bit shorter than the, the given string, right? Um, <coughs> So the highest level that you use is known as the collation strength. So like the level one strength, the primary strength is just for absolute differences in characters, but you get all the way down to like differences in punctuation stuff when you go down to like L4. Okay, so for example, if I just have a strength of L1, that means I'm ignoring accents, case, and punctuation. I just want the absolute difference between characters, like difference between A and B, but no difference between A and capital A like I showed before. If I have L2 strength, that means I want to ignore case and punctuation, but I do want to consider accents, okay? So if I'm looking for an A in a document, and I don't care about anything having to do with the A, if I want anything that's got an A in it, I would use this. But if I want to have an A, but not an A with an accent over it, then I would use this one, right? Um, there's also all these parameters to the correlation algorithm that you can give it that control like the level of, of um, the, the, the kind of information you're considering in the comparison, and sometimes even the order in which you do the, the uh, placement of the things within the, uh, the sort key. Okay, so you can do options like, I want to ignore accents, which are actually before case, but I do want to consider case. Okay, that's one of the things you can configure to do. So, um, there is a default collation. The default collation works for many, many different um, scripts so many different languages, it doesn't cover everything. And in fact, there are collations for many of the Unicode languages, so many that really what you need to be able to do is pick which collation you want based on the actual language you want. You need to be able to tailor the collation to the particular language that you're working in. If you're working in two languages, you need to tailor it such that it knows about the relative ordering of the things among those two languages, or N languages if you've got more than two. Okay. So I just mentioned that you need to be able to do tailoring. So there is this LDML format that the Unicode people publish. And it is a format for doing basically like these little text files. And there's a, a you know, grammar for the kind of markup you can put in text files. And they define an ordering for different um, characters and, and substrings and stuff within different languages. And you can define whatever collation table you want by doing these t tailoring rules. So there's the default collation table. And then you can make your own by essentially modifying the behavior of the default t collision table using this kind of markup. And this is what ICU uses. And I basically took all their data files and then put them into header files as, as uh, like 
string view literals, and th that's, that's how you get to those tailoring rules. Okay, so two examples. These are two actual files. A lot of the files are very long. Some of them are you know, thousands of characters and stuff. So this first one, the normalization on doesn't have any meaning in text, but it has some meaning in ICU. Um, there's these four character codes. So this isn't a misspelling. Like when you reorder Greek, what you're doing is you're taking all the Greek characters and you're yanking them out and putting them in front of all the other uh, languages character sets. So they come first, okay? That's what that does. If you were to say reorder Greek, comma, or not, there's not a comma. You say Greek, Latin, you know, whatever, one of the Chinese uh, variants, so the Chinese scripts, then it would put all those before, you know, anything else, okay? Uh, then you get into the really detailed stuff. It's not important to know what this stuff means, but the point is that there's a way of saying, like the ampersand, you can kind of think of it as, you know, don't relate anything that follows the ampersand to anything that came before it. It's like a, a boundary. And then within the, these boundaries, you say like the capital N is primary before the lowercase n with a tilde, and that is tertiary before the capital N with a tilde, okay? Like that's just what one of the language uh, files does, the one of the tailoring files does. And then you can even have sequences of characters that are collated relative to each other, okay? So this all gets very complicated, and this stuff is actually a little bit expensive. Uh, so I've got a parser that knows how to slurp up these data files, and if you make your own crazy data file, we'll slurp that up too. Uh, and the stuff that comes with ICU, I don't know if there's any other tailoring, um, collation tailoring files that are out there in the wild besides the one that are shipped by ICU, but I've got all the ones that they deliver. So here's the very simple function you use to do collation. <laughs> uh, so all this does actually, it doesn't even do collation, it just generates the, the sort key for a particular string. So you give me a Unicode string, and I'm gonna give you the sort key that you can use to then do comparisons among different strings. So you have to compare the sort keys, not the strings themselves when you do collation, and this just builds the sort key. So you give me um, some range of stuff. This is not range friendly yet. I haven't gotten to this one yet, but uh, so you give me a first and last, and then you give me the collation table. <clears throat> we'll get into a second how you get a collation table. And then given that collation table, I, f I generate the collation sort key for this range of code points. And then these are a lot of these options that I mentioned before that you can do. So like the, uh, you know, you can pick which level uh, you want the sort key to be at. And by default, it's tertiary. Uh, you've got these things related to how you do case. You can put uh, lowercase in front of uppercase or vice versa. You can make um, <coughs> case have its own sort of pseudo level, like a level 2.5 between the second and, and uh, third level uh, considerations. And then there's uh, these other options that are a little bit more obscure. This one only applies to Canadian French, in fact. It's only. <laughs> Um, <coughs> what's that? Where's Louis? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, there's another one that takes a code point range, but like I said, this is in the process of being like range friendly -ified. Uh So here's how you get a collation table. So you can get the default collation table um, by just calling this one function, and there's the, the one that's, um, it's, there's no text involved, there's no parsing involved, there's just like, you know, um, data built into the, the, the build with the collation table in it. But if you do the tailored collation table, what it does is it goes with that default collation table and then it applies whatever these tailoring rules are that you give me. And then it produces the resulting tailored table. And that's the table it gives you back. Uh, if you want nice error messages from, if you've got some custom stuff you're giving here, if you just use one of the, the provided um, headers, you just like name the string view here, and that's all you do. You don't have to refer to the file system or anything. And uh, if you are producing your own tailoring, then you should probably provide a file name if it came from the file system. And then these are callbacks uh, that you know, can be used to report errors and warnings and stuff. Okay, so a typical usage would be something like this. Do the, tailor, the tailored collation table, I don't know if that's Afghani, I forget what language that is, but you know, for all the language abbreviations, I just kept the, the sort of nomenclature from ICU. So whatever their collation tailoring is, that's what you do. Um, in fact, this one has the name standard collation tailoring. There's probably another one uh, that's some other uh, name besides standard. And <coughs> what you get back is a thing that has the semantics of a shared pointer to const, okay? It's not a shared pointer, but it has the same semantics. So the idea is you get this big fat table, you wanna be able to pass it around because mul multiple people need to use it. You don't wanna copy it all the time. Um, this is a nice uh, way to do that. Okay, so some of these can be pretty expensive to compute, these, these tailoring uh, uh, tailored tables, right? 
Uh, specifically the ones in the CJK language, there are so many uh, individual code points that they put into them that they can spend, you can spend a long time doing them. Uh, and so, like I said in the slide, multiple seconds in some cases. So there's a serialization piece that will read and write these tables to a binary format um, on disk. So that, that saves you some time. You can do it up front or you can do it ahead of time offline. So when you do collation, one of the, the details about it is you have to put things in NFD uh, normalization form according to the basic collation uh, algorithm, okay? There is this technical note that talks about the FCC alternate normalization form that I mentioned in the first half. So that is very similar to the um, NFC format. The only difference is in some corner cases it's not quite as compact. So it's almost the optimal uh, representation in terms of size. But the nice thing is, if you use this format, or this uh, normal, normalization form, you, you can modify the, the collation algorithm slightly so you don't have to go to the NFD form at all. You don't have to do any normalization. So you can have one relatively compact normalization form that, you get, that lets you skip a normalization when you do collation. So this is the one normalization form that all the text stuff is gonna be in. Okay, so like I said before, uh, FCC is very similar to NFC. Okay, the bidirection algorithm. This is super complicated. Um, it is probably the most complicated algorithm, the na complicated named algorithm in, in Unicode. Um, <coughs> and it handles things like, okay, I've got uh, some Latin characters and then I've got some Hebrew characters and whatever. So some of those go right to left, some of them go right, uh, left to right, okay? So I need to have a way of figuring out um, how to move through the, um, the segments of the in-memory representation of the text that I've got, such that I know how to render it onto a screen or into a, um, a terminal or what have you. Okay, so in their examples in the Unicode algorithm description, uh, the bidirectional algorithm description, they use capital letters um, to represent um, foreign um, characters that are right to left. And they do that because most people who are reading this, if they had it right to left or left to right, might not be able to spot all the differences. It's hard to tell. So let's pretend that that was in like uh, Arabic, okay? So if I have in memory car means C-A-R, then what I should print out on the screen or to a terminal is car means R-A-C because all the stuff that's in Arabic should go the other way, okay? And sometimes when you do that um, reversal, you end up with the wrong sort of matched pairs of things, right? So sometimes you have angly brackets or square brackets or whatever, and you need to produce the opposite character, the, the, the pair of the, or the, the mate of the one that you've got, okay? Yeah, it's horrible, I know. Like, you're, you're, you're <laughs> you get the look on your face, you didn't even implement it, it's disgusting, right? Anyway, <laughs> all right, okay, so. <laughs> And to make matters that much better, it actually requires that you provide the line break algorithm because when it's doing the reversals of characters, if it was gonna, if, if the, well, some particular reversed range would straddle a line break, it has to treat it differently. So you have to give it the line break alg algorithm that you want, okay? And then you have to use that in the middle of this algorithm. It's just so horrible. I, it's just so disappointing that you specified this this way. Okay, so. Uh, so here is a callable you're going to see me refer to. It's very simple. The idea is it uses that next hard line break uh, function from before, and this just wraps in an interface where you can give me an arbitrary iterator and I can just treat this as a type. So I don't have to pass the, the template parameters all the way down to the people, uh, from the, the top uh, through the people using it to here. Okay? And then there's this other type, which is a bidirectional subrange. This is the thing that's produced by the bidirectional algorithm, uh, my implementation anyway. So what this subrange gives you, it's a very simple range, just like before, it's got empty, begin, and end, and that's pretty much it, except for construction. The magic happens in here, okay? What happens in here is this is basically a variant type that might be a reverse iterator, or might be a forward iterator, okay? Uh, and <laughs> so <laughs> that's not even the whole story, because actually there's a third variant I forgot, which is, remember those reverse characters? Like, I don't know what your iterator type is, and I don't know if I can just, like, find a character somewhere that I can point to with your iterator type. So I actually have a third variant of this which points to a static buffer with all those special characters in it that are reversible. And so it might be one of those too. Yeah, so stupid. All right, anyway. So, so anyway, so this is the bidirectional order 
uh, you know, interface. So you give me uh, the range that we're going to iterate over. Again, this is not range friendly yet. And then I'm going to write the results into the output uh, iterator. And then I'm going to return to you uh, the last uh, place I wrote to. And then um, I also am going to require you to give me, you know, and of course it's defaulted, um, the line break to use. And by default, it just uses the like hard line break. So like when you put a new line, it's going to break there, but otherwise it's not going not to bother. Okay. But you can put whatever uh, callable you want in here that specifies lines break, line breaks at different uh, places. OK, so this produces a sequence of ranges. It's those, those bidirectional subrange. Okay. And like I said, this uh, iterator type that it's got in it is like a variant, and it could be forward or backwards. Okay. So the replacement of individual code points is done with a forward range with just that one code point in it that refers to this special buffer that, that I've got. OK, and here's how this thing works. So again, because we haven't introduced text yet, we're using a string, we're using a UTF range um, of that string. And uh, so here we've got the bidirectional segments in a vector. OK, so this is what we're going to catch the results in. All right? <coughs> and the bidirectional subrange is, why is that a contrast star there? I don't remember why I put that there. I think I might have again, needed to put the uh, transcoding iterator there, the 32, UTF-32 transcoding iterator. Sorry, I wrote the slide like literally like 10 minutes before the first talk started. So that, I, don't, I, I can't uh, swear to this. But anyway, so the, the, the basics of it are right, though, that I call the bidirectional order algorithm, and I give it the range that I want, and then I say, here's the back inserter to, to place stuff into. Uh, this is the place we want to catch it. <coughs> and then we're going to iterate over the bi-di segments, and each one is a subrange. For each one, we're going to copy the subrange.begin, subrange.end, and we're going to copy that into the code points here. Okay, so I, clearly I, I made a, a snafu with the with the type def there, but I mean with the template parameter. But you, I think you get the idea, right? So I'm given a sequence of, of ranges. When I get the lazy version of this, that's kind of like the um, you know give me all the grapheme segments or whatever. This is going to have a slightly different interface where I'm going to be able to say for you know byte i segments. Right, I'll be able to have that in a for loop. Um, but the idea is that it's taking this very sort of complicated kind of output and trying to regularize it so you don't have to deal with the complexities of the output. <coughs> okay, so future Unicode stuff. Um, one thing that's not on the slide is the thing that uh, Peter brought up earlier that I probably want to have some kind of a string builder for the string layer stuff. Um, but uh, for the Unicode stuff in particular, I want to implement case mapping, so we get to like a two upper, two lower, and two title. Um, that only applies to certain scripts. Most scripts don't actually have case. Um, and then collation-based searching um, is probably going to be involving, uh, it's probably going to be required to implement um, what's known as collation folding to implement that. Um, I haven't gotten to that yet either, but that's, that's definitely in the roadmap. OK, so driving all this stuff is a bunch of tables of Unicode data, right? You need to know, like, when you're looking through for um, the, uh, you know, the next line break or the next graphene break or what have you, you need to know, like, one code point corresponds to some particular kind of construct within that break <laughs> algorithm. And so there's a table that says, you know, here's all the um, line break properties that correspond to all the code points. And uh, for each one of those algorithms, there's a table like that. There's also uh, the collation table itself and so on. All of that fits in 2.3 megabytes um, in a release build. So it doesn't have the case mapping data yet. But, um, and, and I think there's some opti optimization opportunities there to make it even smaller. If you look at ICU, it's got like the kitchen sink. I mean, this, the, the size of the thing is tens of megabytes. I'm, I'm not sure how big it is. It's very large. Um, so the idea is, again, making everything super simple, not including like, you know, there's stuff in the um, ICU database that's like uh, time zone data, the names of the characters. I don't have any of that stuff. It's very bare bones. Yeah. Is, isn't the major difference that you have basically the language independent part and they have all the language dependent parts as well? The question is, do I, am I leaving out the language independent parts? Is that what makes those larger? I don't, I don't know. I don't actually know what that means. What do you mean by language dependent parts? Uh, for example, in different languages, there are special rules for uh, some characters that combine differently or sort differently which means that you would need to have a table for every language in existence, which is like 200 plus languages available in Unicode already. But these are the collation tables. That sounds like the collation tailoring tables that you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. I've got all those in here, but they're not, they're not built into the binary. 
they're in headers. So if you don't use one, you don't pull it into your TU and it never goes into your binary. I think they have those in tables as well. Yeah, well they have them in, um, they have them in files that are uh, slurped up and compiled. So I know that they're compiled into their binary. Um, but so, th so that, might be, that might be a major part of why, yeah. <coughs> okay, so um, the, testing layer, uh, the testing of this uh, layer. <laughs> so there's lots of handwritten tests for various things that I wrote. But all the actual named algorithms have test sets that you can just download. Uh, they're like flat text files. You have to do a little parsing, a little bit of code generation with scripting or something. Um, and um, I think, so I want to say it's about 1.2 million individual checks that I have in there so far. And I think there's about 800,000 other checks that correspond just to the bidirectional algorithm. So it's going to be about 2 million <laughs> individual cases. Now, that's not like, you know, big long test cases, I'm talking about like, you know, boost assert or, you know, um, you know, Google assert that one thing that those individual cases, there's about 2 million of them. Still a lot of things and it's been really invaluable to have this because I'm able to move very quickly. Like I do one of the break algorithms and you know, it mostly works, but like 25% of it is breaking. And so I just go through and look in the debugger and see where it's going in the wrong branch for that one case, fix it. And if it doesn't break another case, I move on. And that has made it possible for me to just like kind of be a monkey at a keyboard for a lot of the break algorithms and move very quickly and fix them. Okay, so yeah, like I said, there's, there's a whole bunch of those and um, more than a million checks. And like I said, I, I wrote that before I realized how many checks were involved in the bidirectional algorithm. There's, there's another hundreds of thousands. I, I wanna say it's like 400,000 and there's two test sets that amount to a total of 800,000, but I could be wrong. Okay, so now we finally get to the text layer. Okay, so all that Unicode stuff was, you know, if you want to use a standalone, that's fine, but mostly it's driving this text layer. <laughs> okay, so the text layer includes text itself, which is analogous to string, text view, which is also analogous to string view, and then rope, and rope view, which are analogous respectively to unencoded rope and unencoded rope view. So, here's the synopsis for text. So. The iterator type for these uh, are grapheme iterators, okay? So a text is no longer a sequence of char or even a sequence of code points, it's actually a sequence of graphemes. This was a recommendation that came from a lot of the guys in uh, SG16, uh, committee members and stuff that I was talking about with, um, you know, after the sort of first version of this library, the idea that when I'm dealing with, with um, text as a application developer, most of the time I care about like what is the thing I'm gonna render on the screen and give me a sequence of those. And that's what this is trying to accomplish. Yes. <coughs> Are there any issues getting the convertibility right between iterator and const iterator, given they're temporized on different parameters? Um, the question is, um, what is the, iter the uh, inner convertibility story for iterator and const iterator? Um, bad, I wanna say. I don't think I've actually tested that uh, I probably need some compile tests that that works and to make some adjustments to make that work. Yeah, that's a good note. I, I, that probably doesn't work right now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so default construction, construction from a bunch of things we'll get into, assignment, uh, all the same stuff you expected bef uh, from before, like begin, end, and empty, but now we come to this real series of differences. Max size is, is kind of the same thing as well. Capacity maybe should be renamed. It's the capacity in bytes. There's no size, there's a set of storage bytes to implement a size because every element of the sequence is variable length, to compute the size, it'd have to run through the entire thing. It'd be an order and size. So instead, I've just got this thing where I can look in the underlying um, string. And I, that's something I should have said, actually, is that text's only data member is a string. Text view's only data member is a string view and so forth. Those four types, when you map them into here, they've got some stuff that maintains the Unicode invariance but all they're doing, they're dispatching almost all the work to that lower level type that lives in the string layer. Okay. So there's no size, there's instead a storage bytes, which tells you the, the char count of the underlying string. Capacity gives you the capacity of the underlying string. Distance is kind of like size, but because it's spelled distance, it makes you stop and think, and it's actually an order in operation. Uh, and then uh, max size also takes it, uh, the max size from the string. Uh, the rest of these are pretty straightforward. Um, except for extract and replace. Those are kind of novel. The idea of extract is that if I want to yank out the string for some reason, I don't know why, you might want the string. Um, you can yank out the string without breaking any of the invariants of this type, okay? When you take the string out, now the type's empty. All the invariants are uh, hold when the thing is empty. Then you can put the string back in, 
and you're, when you do that, um, required to meet a precondition that that thing is actually UTF-8 encoded. Um, actually, no, I take that back. That's not, even, that's not even true anymore. You don't care that that thing is UTF-8 encoded, in fact, because all the access to the underlying string is done with these transcoding iterators. And what the transcoding iterators do with malformed UTF-8 is they produce um, replacement characters. So I don't care how garbage your UTF-8 is. I'm going to produce a reasonable sequence of code points from that. And if it's garbage, you can yank this out and fix your garbage and put the garbage back, right? OK. So um, you've got the uh, you know, plus equals, the free uh, operator plus, streaming, and equality operators. But you do not have the inequality operators, right? And that's because to do inequality on Unicode aware strings, you have to do collation. It's incorrect to do it the other way. And I didn't want there to be a simple way of doing a bitwise comparison that's easily misinterpreted as, as uh, something that it's not. OK, so you can uh, construct it from one of these things, the const char star, as we've seen before. Any range modeling char range, this is all the same as it was for string. All the strings, the types of string layer. Also, though, all the types from the text layer now. And all the constructors are explicit, except for the const char star one. So this is very similar to the story from string, except that you can construct, um, oh no, I'm sorry, you can also construct a string from the text layer. So this is, this is just like from string. Yeah, OK. Uh, and assignment is the same as construction, just as always. There's no slicing operation. So now we don't have this nice sort of iterator, uh, sorry, uh, index-based view of the contents of, of this type, right? Because now we have these variable length uh, elements. Yeah. OK. <laughs> so uh, we have um, bidirectional iterators instead of random access. We don't have integer indices or in integral indices. Um, and we have an insert defined for iterator positions only. Again, there's no integral indices. And um, <coughs> we accept all the same types for construction and assignment uh, for inserts. The exception for string was that we didn't take the text types without using a verbose interface, but now we're in the land of maintaining those invariants, so we're allowed to insert these in here with a convenient interface. And uh, so replace and plus equals are the same story. Okay, so the equality operators are defined between text uh, and other text layer types. We don't define them between text layer types and string layer types, just as we talked about before. Um, and when we compare um, well, th because if we did that, then we'd be ignoring the fact that we need to have normalization and correlation aware uh, comparisons. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, I already said this that the iteration is bi directional, not random access. And because of that, we can't have a size because it would be O1, uh, ON. Um, we've got this storage bytes thing that returns the total size in bytes. And distance gives us the actual size by doing an, uh, an ON um, operation. And. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I got into this stuff a little too early or something. Anyway, th so this, this I already talked about extract and replace. <clears throat> so the underlying text is assumed to be UTF-8 encoded. And um, because the transcoding iterator always saves us from bad encodings, we can always rely on that. So uh, because we keep the underlying text normalized, we're allowed to do a bitwise operator equals, uh, the operator double equals. And it's a nice, cheap, easy operator double equals. The normalization form is always FCC, and this is almost always optimal in the use of uh, space, uh, and it also has nice properties for collation. Mark. So I think that that defeats your, your free replace, because um, you, have to, you have this invariant about normalization, so you need to check normalization when you replace the guts, right? Anyways. <coughs> oh, yeah. OK, so the comment was, when you do the when you do the replace, um, you need to establish um, the normalization. And I think that is, in fact, what it does. I was referring only to the UTF-8 part, but I forgot about that. Yeah. So I, I think it actually, uh, it doesn't assume that as a precondition. It just makes sure that's the right normalization form. Okay, so it does work. I, I think it does work, yeah. Uh, I might provide another overload with a tag type that says, like, hey, believe me, it's in the right normalization form. And you're on your own if you violate that precondition. That's a reasonable thing to add. OK, so when you've got a normalized string, though, you can't concatenate it and end up with a normalized string in the general case. They're not closed under concatenation. They're similarly not closed under like slicing things out of them. right? You can't, uh, I shouldn't say slicing it out of them. I should say inserting things into the middle of them. Okay, um, And so you need to renormalize during these operations. So this is the main work that these types do in, this, in the text layer is they establish that invariant over the, um, the, the string types that they are FCC encoded. 
right? They don't have to do anything with the normalization because, I mean, the uh, uh, encoding, because again, we don't really care about garbage in the encoding because we have this way of dealing with that in a consistent way. And, you know, usually that's not a, that's not a, a concern anyway because the way you get at the guts of all the text layer types is by dealing with uh, grapheme iterators, and those are always falling on UTF-8 well-formed boundaries because they're always dealing with the things at the code point or grapheme level. Okay, so text view. Again, text view, a lot like string view, is like text view with the immutable stuff cut out. And it fits all in one slide. It's nice, nice and terse, okay? You have the stream operation and equality operation is defined as well. So you can construct um, from a text view or a text or a pair of text iterators, and that's kind of it. And the reason is because this thing is not allowed to do work that mutates underlying storage, and in order to, ver to, to um, uh, maintain the invariant or establish the invariant in the constructor that this stuff is UTF-8 encoded and FCC normalized, it would need to do work if you gave it anything that wasn't already, didn't already have those invariants true of it, right? Okay. <laughs> all right, no problem. Uh, okay, so constructors are all non-explicit because we want to be able to make implicit conversions and put these text views into um, interfaces where we want to catch these two types, text and text view. Uh, and assignment is the same as for construction. And then we're kind of done with that one. Okay, so now rope. Rope is just like an encoded rope, except that, of course, it has these uh, UTF-8 uh, encoding and FCC normalization guarantees. So once again, we have the storage byte and this distance thing going on down here, so we don't have like size, like normal. Um, when I say like normal, like a normal uh, sequence container. Um, and again, I have this questionable for each segment thing going on here. Uh, and this time, clear is no except. So either I made a mistake here or I made a mistake in the other place. I got to resolve that later. Um, and uh, we have uh, free operator plus streaming and equality operations. Again, none of these have inequality operations. Um, and you can construct one of these from all the same types as you can construct with uh, a text from, which is just about anything string or text-like. And we um, have the same operations defined for the same operand types as the text text operations. I don't know what that sentence means. Does anyone else know what that sentence means? All right, moving on. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> so yeah, what's up? In the, uh, in the, in the text rope, uh, uh -huh. do, you, do you enforce as your invariant, as any of your invariants that, uh, that each, each um, chunk, each whatever you want to call it, each piece of the rope has an integral number of uh, graphemes in it? Y so the can you break the graphemes across segments? Yeah, so the question is, um, do the segments of a rope have um, whole graphemes in there, or can you have sliced graphemes? Mm -hmm. And um, I did not make any allowance for ensuring that the graphemes are not sliced. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I felt like that was uh, sort of an unreasonable thing to do. I actually considered doing that, but then I thought like, I don't really care. And if you use that lower level um, interface, then you know, you're on your own. You're doing that for some crazy reason. Okay. And maybe that makes that interface not make sense at all. Yes? I was hoping the for each grapheme algorithm member. Um, sorry, the for each graphene no, member? No, no the, the one you want for each of the segments, sorry, not for each graphene. For, oh. for each segment. For each yeah. segment. If the segments aren't integral number of graphenes, it would have many segments. Yeah, this is a good point. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that was uh, Marshall's point implicitly, right? Is that what you're getting at, Marshall? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I so. I think it would, simpli it would simplify the internal code if you could do that, but I don't know if you can. If you decided not to do that, okay. Uh, I, well, it doesn't simplify the internal code simply because um, when you want to insert a grapheme, mm -hmm. you end up inserting it at some, actually, you know what? It might actually naturally fall out that way. I have to think about that. But it, it might turn out that it, it, you, you can't split them. Yeah, that, that was why I was wondering. Yeah, that, that might just shake out. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Mark? Yeah, I just think that for each segment doesn't make any sense at all unless you can't provide that guarantee that you're not, that you all your graphemes are break it. Yeah. Yeah. So the comment was <clears throat> having the for each segment when you don't have the guarantee that a segment has a whole number of graphemes and it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Okay. So rope view is a lot like um, the unencoded rope view. Again, we have this difference of uh, size versus storage bytes at distance. And we have the for each segment thing hanging out there. 
Um, and as you can guess, this is a very similar story to the other guys. Okay, so all those slides I showed you about, like how do I pick among all these string types, they all apply to the text types. The question is like, there's another dimension to that uh, set of questions, which is, do I care about Unicode or not? And then if I care about Unicode, I want to pick one of the types from text and if, uh, the text layer, and if I don't, I want to pick one of the types from the string layer. That, that's all there is to that, okay? So even though there's these four types, they have the same interrelation amongst, them, amongst each other that the string types do amongst themselves. <coughs> so we don't have multiple choices for encoding normalization or allocation. And that's, again, that radical simplicity idea, right? So the FCC choice is really good for collation. It's really good for, you know, like having things in a consistent normalization form or it's really good for bitwise comparisons. It's not great for, um, you know, if, if you want to have a W3C compliant web page and you want to use this to drive it, you're going to have to do transcoding to the NFC form. And that's going to be relatively cheap because you've got it in something very close to the NFC form, but it's not free. If you want to deal with the Mac OS file system, I'm pretty sure it only accepts NFD form Unicode, right? Uh, it's, it's even weirder than that. It's weirder than that? What is it? It's, it's partially composed. Partially composed. That's exactly. That's lovely. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just. I'm already anticipating what it's going to be. Right. Ah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So again, this is a very opinionated choice. Partly, it was driven by my, you know, quest for retaining sanity while I'm trying to implement all this stuff. So um, maybe this won't survive boost review, right? It's, it's reasonable to say like, well, we're gonna have an internal uh, like um, type def inside the thing. It tells you what normalization form it is. And this is just to make it things a lot more complicated in some cases, but it might be necessary. Uh, okay, other stuff. So in the process of doing all this, I came across the need for several things that aren't Unicode specific, but that I found to be incredibly handy. And I wanna try to, you put these things in boost, maybe one day standardize them. Um, and so they're, they're interesting on their own. Okay, first is segmented vector. And this is um, like very much in line with the, the talk that Juan Pedro gave before that I mentioned earlier, where he had something uh, that I sort of turned into a rope. The, if you take the rope specific parts out of it, you get a segmented vector, which is very similar to what he originally uh, presented. Uh, I have a high quality try implementation. Uh, it turns out when you do Unicode collation, uh, you really care about um, using a try. The reason you care is that um, when you do the collation table lookup, you want to take some sequence of code points. And you want to go and say, like, find me something that matches that sequence of code points in the collation table. Remember how the collation table can have entries in it that have multiple code points, right? You go and you look something up. And then after that, you might skip some code points and then later on say, hey, if I add this code point to the sequence of code points I had before, does that match something in the collation table? Let me go see if that matches too. So you've got this thing where you want to take like a sequence match and see if it works. And then later on, you might want to extend the sequence match. It's not a good container for that besides a try. Okay, so segmented vector. Uh, segmented vector is, like I said, a lot like a, a rope. What I did was um, I got rid of all the string specific kind of API and I added in a few things that make it more vector-like. So it's not quite a drop-in replacement for a vector, but it's very close. Um, and the, um, probably the biggest points of divergence are the, you know, this equal root thing, which I had in the other, uh, the other rope. So you can kind of see like, are these things pointing to the same tree uh, in the for each segment um, uh, iteration sort of pseudo algorithm. And then uh, the rest of this is kind of the standard story, right? We've got uh, inserts, erase, replace. Replace was kept even though it seems very string specific because it's actually so much more efficient to do a replace as one step rather than an insert followed by an erase that it makes sense to keep it here even though it's supposed to be much more uh, vector-like and vector doesn't have a replace. Okay, so like I said, it's very similar in API to unencoded rope. Um, I retained the replace stuff because of, uh, for efficiency reasons, and I added some things to make it more vector-like, like pushback. And this is essentially the same stuff I showed you from before, except that uh, instead of uh, unencoded, or yeah, I think it was unencoded rope that I was using before. Yeah, unencoded rope. So this has replaced that with a, a segmented vector, and that's it. 
So it lets you do these really simple undo um, operations. This was really useful in doing coalition tailoring um, because you often have to sort of attempt to make changes to these very long sequences, sequences that are long enough that when you do mutations in the middle of them, you end up paying for uh, bumping down all the elements. And if you can do something like a segmented vector where you just poke stuff into the middle and you essentially make references around to the stuff that was around what you inserted and then a new node for the insertion, it's way, way cheaper. It made the... Um, Collation tailoring algorithm, really simple to write and very efficient. Uh, and then here's the other side. So um, the other side being the other side of the undo system. So before I had like an insert function, right? And so this is a generalization of that, where you give me some callable and I'm going to do the same thing I did before with uh, insert, where I'm going to get the new undo state and then I'm going to do the operation. But instead of specifically doing insert, I'm doing whatever operation you told me. So you could give this, you know, you could bind this to a bunch of keystrokes that do a bunch of different operations and each one could have its own like lambda that it passes or what have you, right? So this is a generalization of the stuff I showed before. Okay, the try. Now the try is pretty interesting. A try is, show of hands, who knows what a try is already? Okay, great, so we're in the right room. Okay, so a try is essentially a prefix tree. Each node represents the prefix uh, of all the nodes you've seen so far of some sequence you're trying to match, okay? So a try is essentially an associative container it's not necessarily a container, but it's an associative thing that takes um, a sequence of things that's the key, and then there's some associated value type. So here's what a, a try might look like. Um, I'm sorry if this is a little small. That's an E and that's a C. <laughs> okay, so, um, so let's say we have this uh, sequence of associated values, right? So we have these sequence values that are the keys, and we have these uh, non-sequence values, although they could be sequence values that are the values. Um, so car is associated with 15, cat with 9, eat with 100, and so on. So the way this try is built is <clears throat> each of these try nodes represents a node inside of an actual like tree data structure. And what I've done here is I've represented what the uh, prefix of this node is. Even though the internal data structure doesn't have that, it makes it easy to understand what's going on. And then if there's a value associated with that particular prefix, then there's a value here. Otherwise, there's not a value. Okay. So what happens is, if I want to look up car, I see, okay, well C is in the list of children. So I go down here, and I see that it's there, and there's not a value associated with it. I'm going to keep going. I mean, it doesn't matter if there's a value associated with it in this case, because I'm going to keep going, but um, it's, it's nice to note. And then I, the next element of the sequence is A, and then that leads me to this node, and the prefix for that is CA, and then R is a child, and I get down to car, and I see the associated value is, is uh, 15. If I was looking for card, with the D in the end, I would get here and I would say, ah, there's no child with a D in it. I, that's not a match. And I can't go there, right? Okay, so here's a synopsis for try. Try is much more like a uh, standard container than the other things you've seen. This one is actually not a container because it has no iterators, okay? It turns out there's a non-trivial cost associated with maintaining the data structures you need or the, the, the data, the side data you need for doing in-order iteration. So I just didn't do that for the try. There's a try map and a try set uh, that, that do have iterators or proper containers. Okay, so um, I can uh, construct tries in various ways. It's not too important to get into that. I think the interesting thing is um, down here. So th this is all, you know, vaguely like a map, okay? The way I can construct these and the kinds of things I have going on, I can say empty, size, and contains. It's all like a map. Here's where the novelty comes in. With a try, I can say, give me the longest subsequence that has these key iterators. And the key iter is the, whatever the iterator type of the key type is of the um, structure, right? So we get this key type, and the key iter is whatever that is, you know, colon, colon, iterator. Um, and it's not, I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying here because you don't actually look into that key, t key type to get the colon, colon, iterator. This is anything whose value type is convertible to the value type of the key will work here, okay? And similarly, any range will work here. So if the key type is a string, I can pass in a vector of char and that works, okay? So as long as it, it's compatible, we've, we've got a match, right? Okay, so the longest subsequence does that same process I was talking about where it goes down the nodes looking for matches, and when it gets to the end um, of as far as it can go here without running out of nodes to go to, then it stops and it returns this sort of token type. There's just a void star in here. And that, that you can use in the rest of the API later on. So it tells you, this is the place I found. And the match result has information in it like 
was this a match? Like, is there a value associated with this or not? There's a longest match, which is similar to longest subsequence, except that it goes as far as it can, like before. And then if it stops on something that's not a match, it backs up until it finds a match, okay? Because it doesn't want just an arbitrary node. You want to say, like, how far can I go through this and still find a match? And that's what I want, okay? <coughs> um, and then you can extend the match that you found um, by returning, uh, by, you know, passing in the thing that was returned from for the previous call to longest subsequence or longest match, and then saying, like, if I give you this one element of the key type, um, what is the match result? If, if I didn't find anything new, I just return the same thing as the input. If I found something new, I return the token for that. And similarly, I can give it a, a bunch of things, and it will extend the subsequence there, too. If I'm at a certain place in the search, I can say, like, what are all the next nodes? And whatever all the next nodes are, write them out through this out iterator. I can also um, index with the whole key by itself, or anything compatible with the whole key. Again, like a string and a vector of char are going to be compatible in this case. Uh, and then get the actual associated value out. If the associated value um, is not there, then you know that's what the I've got this optional ref thing going on. Uh, and I'll show what that's like in a second in terms of uh, user code. Uh, yeah, so the rest of this is very map-like. So the nice thing about tries is the lookup is comparable to hashing. And probably the reason for that is that each step you do when you go through um, the, uh, the, the process of ch chasing all the pointers down the try is you, you eat one element of the input sequence, okay? And the tries are only benef beneficial when you've got like an input sequence, right? And not just like uh, an int or something for the, for the key type. And then, of course, the similar story applies to hashing, where you eat all the inputs, and then you have a hash function, and then it's an order one operation to take the actual hashed value and find it in the, the, um, the container, right? So <coughs> you've got in the neighborhood of the same performance. It's going to be a little faster, a little worse, depending on the input data and the other particulars. But the nice thing is that you get um, these longest match and extension kind of APIs or easy to implement, and you can't really do that with a red-black tree, you can't do that with a hash map, mm -hmm. right? You can't even do it with a flat map, right? So this is really the only <coughs> game in town for doing that particular kind of thing that I was doing inside of the collation tailoring algorithm efficiently. So this is probably the most controversial part. So this is um, how operator bracket works, and I would love it if map worked something like this, because one of the things about map is that the fact that when you do the bracket operator, it creates a new object <coughs> is baffling to anyone coming new to the language especially if they've ever used any other programming language, right? Because none of them do that, right? So let's say I've got this try from strings to ints, and I say, give me element t foo. I didn't specify that's in there or not. Let's say I don't really know if it's in there, right? So the safe thing to do is, of course, I, I ask this optional, hey, do you have a value? And if you do, <clears throat> then I assign through here. This probably doesn't work for a value type of bool. I'm not sure if that's ambiguous. I think it probably is. Probably ambiguous for int too. Uh, element would be thing not zero. Int not zero. Uh, no, but this is a this is a conditional conversion okay. to bool, and so it it uh, it's better because I I did it with this exact code and, and it works. Yeah. Uh, okay. So and then um, if if for some reason I'm absolutely sure that that's already in there, I can just write it like this and, and skip the check. It's unsafe to do, but in some context you might do that. But the point is that I'm able to write this for, uh, this being the, the use of the bracket operator with const and uh, mutable um, tries, either one. So as I said before, there's no iterators, so try itself is not a container. Uh, there are try map and try set that are proper uh, containers <coughs> with iterators. And um, they have like a, a, a very familiar interface, except that they have those kind of longest match and extension uh, API. Uh, elements. And because of the runtime cost, I have the try as an extra thing, as I said before. Okay, so another thing that I came across was the need for lots of things that are a lot like the standard algorithms, but for which there isn't a standard algorithm. <coughs> so for instance, find not. Why don't we have that? I could say find if, and I could say find if not, but I can't say find not. If I want to find the next element of some sequence that's not x, I have to write find if and a bunch of stuff, right? It'd be nice if I had a find not. It's not necessary, but we've got all these other things. I'd really like it if there was a find not like there's a find if not. Okay, this is a minor complaint. 
but this is more substantial. Let's say you want to find an element at or before your iterator IT that you've, that you've got, right? So you can find forward at or uh, after that iterator just using std find, okay? There's no find backward. There's search backward, or maybe it's, maybe it's called find backward? No, no, it's not. Search. What's, it's called, sur no, search is the, search backward, I think, is what I'm thinking of. But, but search backward is like search, and then it takes a, a sequence of things mm -hmm. to try to match. It's looking for a subsequence going backwards. You can't look for a thing going backwards, okay? So because of that, you might think, oh, well, I'm just going to make these reverse iterators, and I'm going to say find like r first, r last, and we'll look for x, OK? When you do this, something kind of curious happens, which is because you want to include IT in your search, you have to increment this one, like the, the, the end of the iterator in the forward view, or the beginning of the iterator in your reverse view. And I don't have to increment the, the base iterator I give to the reverse iterator for the, the end of the sequence, OK? That kind of mismatch is, it, it looks like a bug when you first look at it, right? Then I have to make sure that I didn't go to the end. You always have to check for end when you've got a find. And then I do this little trick where I have to be, I have to go, uh, I have to bump the result by one before I take base. So I'm at the right, I'm pointing to the right iterator, right? <coughs> so it's not the greatest code. Um, you have to increment only one of these things uh, in the boundary. Um, and this is a half open range where it's open on the low side because we're, we're going that way. Um, and <coughs> you have to decrement the thing before you do base and stuff like that. Um, this is not easy for people to read. It's not easy for people to write. It's not easy to teach. And I think this part is one of the problems that I have with it that's, well, I'll show you what I mean. So if I had find backward, and find not backward, all the variants of, of find, including the find not that I just said I would like to have, then I could just write that, right? I still have to do this increment, okay? But now the only piece of, of uh, sort of noise in the signal is, wait, what's that? You think about it for a second, you're like, oh, you want to include that in the search, right? When I got rid of like the, the finds using reverse iterators or raw for loops or whatever that I had in the however many different um, break algorithms, and I replaced it with this, exactly one of them needed to search for the um, code point before this. They wanted to not include this, right? So when I just sort of cut and pasted code that looked like this, it didn't work for that one. And the nice thing about having that in there like that is that when I then wrote, um, uh, sorry, when I wrote this again, I thought I had this as an, as an extra step. When I wrote this again, with just IT in it, it sort of jumps out that, oh, that's a choice that's being made, right? Before, with all this noise, you can't tell that that's a choice, really. There's like too much stuff going on. It doesn't stand out to you. In fact, it didn't stand out to me so much that in my own code, when I replaced this, I didn't even notice that that wasn't there for one of them. And it, it, it crashed when I ran it, OK? So I think this is a pretty strong argument for having these. I don't think all the algorithms need to be, able to do, do, need to be doable in reverse, but I think this one needs to be doable in reverse. Finding a thing uh, in the sequence before where you are is pretty nice. Yes? Yeah, also, dereferencing a reverse iterator is a more expensive process than just dereferencing a regular, regular iterator. You've got to go back through the base and so forth. Yes. So this is actually a more efficient implementation as well as being more convenient. Yes. So the comment was, every time you do um, an operation with the reverse iterator, you're usually dereferencing the underlying base iterator first, and this, this is actually going to be more efficient. Yeah. Uh, the other that you were thinking of was find end. Which, find end, thank which you. For some reason, is not named search backward. end or something yeah. like that. Uh, that's always gotten me. So find end is basically search backward, but it's called find end for some reason, and it's not find. Well, no, it's, it's search it's last. Yeah. Really yeah. Find yeah. the last occurrence of this pattern in this state. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so if we only want to look um, strictly before IT. Oh, this was the thing I was trying to find. OK, so this is the case I was talking about where I just want to say IT and not next. OK. Um, and this is also what I was trying to say about it. So whenever we see that difference in the code that's much more literate and we see what's going on and, and we can tell that that was a choice, right? OK. And I also find this pattern of code to be relatively common. This came up several times in implementing Unicode algorithms, especially in the bidirectional algorithm. It happens over and over again, the bidirectional algorithm. So let's say I've got some sequence of stuff. In that sequence of stuff, I want to find all the runs of the value x, right? I want to find all the runs uh, of values that match some predicate, but only the ones that are contiguous, right? 
So what I would typically do is I would say, let's start at the beginning. While we're not at the end, find um, from where we are to the end some value we're looking for. And you know, I did this on purpose and didn't use the other algorithm to show like in the current state of affairs, this is the garbage you have to write, that if I want to find if not in that same sequence, or sorry, not that same sequence, from where I just found uh, to the end, something that is not equal to the x that I want, okay? So if I had just a find not, this would be much nicer. But in either case, I don't want to write both these things, right? Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the loop, I, I go to the, the current next and then go back to the next iteration, uh, back around for the next iteration, okay? So if instead I define this very simple range type, this looks a lot like the CP range and the bidirectional order range and all that kind of stuff. If I had one of those, then I could write a very simple function that says like, give me uh, the range of things I want to look in, here's the value I want to look for, or here's the predicate I want to try to match um, in the sequence. And then whenever I find whatever I'm looking for, um, run this function on the, uh, the range that I found, right? Another um, overload might be, you know, write out through some out iterator um, a sequence of these things, right? Those are, those are each reasonable things to, to, to put for the, the API. Uh, okay, so when I did this, um, it clarified all kinds of code uh, that was doing this with raw loops and was doing essentially this over and over again. And when you take a bunch of code that looks like that and make it look like this in you know, literally 10 places in your code, it makes a huge, huge difference in terms of like signal versus noise. So I found this to be very nice. So my, my approach is um, I'm probably going to um, propose this for boost um, algorithm, like all the algorithms I was talking about. Seems like a reasonable first step, and then maybe try to standardize these. I'm also probably going to try to get the um, segmented range, uh, sorry, segmented vector, and the, uh, the tries into boost as well. I've been in contact with the maintainer of boost uh, container. And he wasn't really interested in those because they're not like standard containers. In particular, two of them are not standard containers. And um, he also supports stuff all the way back to C++ 98, which I'm not going to try to do. OK, so that is it. Questions? Mark? You can have container two, since you wanted two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, anyone else <coughs> with, with a real question? <laughs> Give me some macro about misusing no excerpts. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, Tell me. Oh, the uh, the convention in the standard is narrow contracts don't have no excerpts, so we're using iterator oh, ranges. Right. If you've got a range object, you're great. An iterator pair, you've got the precondition that they actually form a valid range. Right. So the comment is, don't put no accept on things that have a narrow contract yeah. uh, because that's the guidance. And yeah, I hate that rule. I really hate that rule so much. I wish we could get rid of it. Um, so that's why I didn't do that theory. So I just philosophically disagree with it. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that rule. But yeah. So I saw another hand over here. Wasn't there a hand over here? Yes. Uh, are, is your try available somewhere? Is it on the GitHub? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's uh, up on GitHub, the uh, right there. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, like a, it's like he's a plant. He was a plant, and I told him to do that at the end. Um, so yeah, you can grab that. And the try stuff is actually standalone. It's even in its own namespace to make that easier. Um, so yeah, grab the try if you want it. The segmented vector is really fun too. So, Mark. Um, can you repeat, um, I think this is from the first talk, can you repeat the logic about why you can't support inequality? Of what? Inequality uh, of what? You mentioned on a bunch of the, like the views, you don't support inequality, but you do support equality, or did I mishear that? I, I said I'm not supporting inequality on repeated text view in particular because I found it to be wonky when I was writing the tests for it. I found that when I was trying to cover the cases of like, okay, well this one's got a string view that like doesn't have the same stuff as this other repeated view because it has a different string view in it. Like the only times in which the operator less than made any sense at all is when they actually had the same character the same number of times or one of them had um, some string view that was a repetition of the other one's string view for some reason. And so I was like, this is like a very minority use case. And I don't think people are going to care about it. Repeat string view is supposed to be like as dog simple as possible. So it was, it was a question of removing API. Okay. Um, I, I, the other places where there's no inequality is typically like when we're comparing strings to text. And that's because of Unicode you know, normalization and encoding questions. Yeah. But there's a hand over here. When you say yeah. 
Well, he was, he was next. Go ahead. I was just curious where, where the name Try comes from. Like, what language is it in? What is it? Uh, it's in English. It was invented by the inventor of the Try. It's, it's um, sometimes pronounced tree, tree but the... Yeah, but the, the, the guy that developed it said it should be called a try. And I forget which famous computer scientist. Uh, so it doesn't have a meaning, it's just the name? It, it does not have a meaning. It's supposed to be a tree, but um, it's not any ordinary tree, so they spelled it differently so they could distinguish try. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you had a question or a comment. Um, just a clarification. When you say you don't support <coughs> inequality, but you support equality, it means you support operator double equals. I'm, when I say inequality operations, I mean like the relational operators, yeah, I think. Thank you. Yes, I, I just that's the proper terminology, yeah, thank you. I was confused yeah. about that. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. hoping that I was the only one. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. Okay, <laughs> when, I say, when I say inequality, I, I should have said, I think, relational operators. Okay, thank you, so yeah, you, yeah. You do support operator bang equals. Yes, operator double equals, operator bang equals are always supported together or not at all. Right, <laughs> yeah, and in, it turns out they're always supported, <clears throat> yeah, so, yes. I mean. I mentioned char et in the very beginning, but I kind of wanted to mention it again um, because at some point that's significant because it's non aliasing type and because it just it's decidedly unsigned. And it's kind of unfortunate that we don't have it yet. Right. Because this is a huge body of code that could benefit from both of those things. Um, so the comment was char et doesn't alias and it is always unsigned. And so it might make a nice, are you saying like for value type for like a string, uh, like the underlying? I'm just saying as a, a very opinionated decision, if I had my druthers and you started this year instead of last year, that might be a very opinionated decision, which is I will only work on compilers that, or I will optimize best on compilers that support this new thing. Uh, yeah, that's, so the, the optimization opportunities might be really significant. Yeah, that, 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 yeah. that's interesting. So. But, but again, you're talking about having it as the um, value type that, that is the, the value type of the underlying sequence of a yeah, string, like right? Yeah, yeah. okay. Like so, I mean, my current plan for it was just to support it in interfaces because, you know, char 8 is supposed to be, um, you can only get a char 8 from something that's properly UTF-8 encoded, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's supposed to be the purpose of it, right? Um, and so I, I didn't want to muddy the waters by saying like, this is a char ET and that's always UTF-8 encoded because I don't know that, I don't know that that's gonna be the assumption, but I think a lot of people are gonna see that and they're gonna know that, oh, when I do a U8 literal, I know that's UTF-8 encoded and the thing that I get is a char ET and so I think that those are all UTF-8 encoded. Um, the signedness or not signedness of char doesn't matter for my implementation. I mean, I, I just, you know, so I, I'm, I'm working around that in the cases where I care about it, but the optimization stuff might be interesting to, to explore. Yeah. Um, so the tree construct When you start with a very large thing, then you do some ed little edit in the middle of it, right? Yeah, you're talking about uh, like ropes in general or? Ropes, yeah, yeah right. ropes in general, yeah. sorry. Um, but it's gonna be very, <coughs> it's gonna be very inefficient if you have a little thing and then you do a bunch of changes to that little thing. So, th so the comment is um, a rope is gonna be efficient for large strings where you do edits to it, but not, uh, not small strings where you do edits versus like using a string, which is just a, a buffer, right? right. And, and I think that's true in, in the data sharing case, and I think it's probably very similar to the performance of string in the non-data sharing case. Um, what I mean by that is you have to chase one pointer to get to the buffer of a string, you have to chase two pointers to get to the buffer of the string that's hanging off of the single node of a, of a rope. So if no one is sharing that node and you make an edit, you just edit the string in place and you're done. Like you don't do any of the complicated B-tree algorithms, you don't rebalance trees, you don't do any of the stuff, you don't allocate any nodes as long as there's capacity, right? So if you, have a, if you have a rope and you're the only owner of that rope, no one else has a copy of it, you can do all kinds of mutations to it and stuff and that tends to happen to just the string that you've got in one internal node. So you're saying that <coughs> if, my, if I'm the only owner and my string is, is my Russian novel, mm -hmm. Okay, so that is a different case. So the question was like, what if the string is a Russian novel, right? So what happens then is either you got that string by composing a Russian novel and then saying, here's my string all at once, right? right? right. That, that's a way of getting it in there. But if what you did to get it in there was you added it chunk by chunk, it's not going to um, end up in the same node because 
it won't append to a string um, more than a certain size. And right now I've just got a hard coded value of 4096. Like the chunks are not larger than 4096 if you do normal editing, right? If you move a string into it, it's just gonna take the string because that's a very optimal thing to do in that case. If you edit that thing and you're gonna add to it, even though you're within the capacity of it, if it's larger than a certain size, it could be like, no, I'm gonna put this in another node. So it's gonna, it's gonna chunk it up for you implicitly a lot of the time. The case I was talking about was like, if you really do have a small string though, a small amount of text, right? Then I think it's gonna be pretty close to the performance of string, not as good, but pretty close, right? It's gonna be in the neighborhood. We're talking like, you know, 20%, 10%, something like this. Not, not super, it's not gonna break the bank, well, right? Not for a bunch of little things, that's for sure, because you're gonna have two allocations, not one. Uh, no, for, for a, a degenerate rope, you only have one allocation. You've just got one node, you have no interior nodes. So you have to, well, you have to follow that pointer to the, to the node, and then the node has a pointer, you know, within the string object in the node, it points to the actual buffer that the string owns, right? So you have to chase two pointers. Um, so for lots of, like, string level, character level operations, that extra pointer chasing is gonna be expensive. Two allocations, right? Oh, I'm, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, that's right. There's two allocations. I was, th like, I was thinking about the interior nodes, but that's right. You have to allocate the node itself, and then the string has to allocate. That's right, yeah. So you have to do those two allocations. And, um, but the thing is that in the lifetime of the string, you're not doing any reallocations of the node itself. You're only doing those reallocations. So you'd pay for that one allocation up front, and then it's a very similar cost after that. That's right. Yeah. OK. I know there was another hand. Was so it you, Jonathan? I was yeah. comment about the tree try. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the original person who coined the term called it uh, a tree after retrieval. Oh, I, really? I, look it up I, I remembered it differently from what you said, so I, I just looked huh. it up. Interesting. Okay, so the comment was that tree was originally, try was originally pronounced tree because it was part of retrieval. By the person who coined the term, who wasn't right. actually the person who described it originally. Interesting. Okay. I could have sworn I heard someone say that that was the opposite of that. But either way, if you looked up on Wikipedia, that's probably right. Yeah. I had, yeah. I had <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. Uh, anyone else? Yes. Uh, did I hear you say when you were describing the, the ropes and the, uh, the way you do the reference counting notes that uh, when you copy a rope, you're incrementing the reference counts of all the nodes all the way down? No, I was specifically saying you don't know. So the question was, when you copy a rope, do you have to um, increment any of the ref counts to any of the nodes besides the root? And the answer is no. I, I explicitly said, like, you don't have to do that, only because, like, when I gave this same talk to my local users group, someone was like, we'll have to bump, like, all these unbounded number of ref counts. That's terrible. And it's just the one for the root node. Because each one has its own individual ref count you are able to essentially share entire subtrees. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyone else? All right, I think that's it. Thanks everybody.